Let's continue chapter 28, section 2. Aggregate expenditure are the total amounts of spending on final goods and services. Um, this amount consists of four main components or classifications. We have consumption, investment, government spending, and net foreign spending. So you'll notice this looks very much like what we talked about when we talked about real gross domestic product. Well, it's basically the same. Remember that production equals expenditure in the aggregate, that this is a national income accounting identity. So it makes sense that these four components would be the same for aggregate expenditure as they are for aggregate um, um, production. This is just the expenditure method of calculating production. So we can also talk about expenditure in terms of autonomous consumption or autonomous expenditure. Autonomous expenditure is that part of expenditure that's not determined by income. It doesn't vary with income. You can think of it as the amount of expenditure that happens even if we have zero income. So it's the subsistence level of expenditure. Um, they're unrelated to income and they remain constant at all levels of income. So this um, essentially is um, what we spend no matter what. Now, one thing to remember about this is while we say it's unrelated to income, it can be related to different levels of income depending on your economy. For example, the, uh, a person in the underdeveloped world's autonomous expenditure might be lower than that of someone in the United States. So autonomous expenditure in the U.S. might be much higher than, say, the autonomous expenditure in, for example, Nigeria. Um, included expenditure or induced expenditures are expenditures that change with income. They are directly related to income, and when income changes, they're going to change by less than income. Because usually, what happens when we have a dollar more income, we'll spend less than an additional dollar. Um, um, so, like for example, let's say we earn a hundred dollars more, we may only spend an additional seventy dollars more. So, normally, this um, induced expenditure climbs at a slower rate than income does. So, if we plot this all out, we can see here. First of all, we come back to our our plot like we had in the introduction with real production on the um, vertical axis and real income on the horizontal axis, and we can see here this constant part or a fixed part or we can even call this the intercept of the aggregate expenditure function is what we call autonomous expenditure and notice it doesn't change as income changes then we can see the difference between the autonomous uh, expenditure and actual expenditure or aggregate expenditure that's what we call the induced expenditure now notice the slope of this is less than one what does that mean? That means that as we add an additional dollar of income, we won't add an, in, an additional dollar of um, actual expenditure we, or aggregate expenditure. We may only add, in this case, 50 cents worth of aggregate expenditure. All right, the slope of this aggregate expenditure line is called the marginal propensity to expend. All right, um, or the marginal propensity of expenditure. In other words, it is the um, additional expenditure we will have if we have one more dollar of income. So let's define this a little more carefully. Marginal propensity to expend is the ratio of the change in aggregate expenditure to change in aggregate income. So the marginal propensity to expend is aggregation of the changes of each of the components of aggregate expenditure um, and the change in income. So marginal propensity to extend always has to be between 0 and 1. We can't spend more than our income, and we can't save more than our income. So if we have 0 um, marginal propensity to expend, that means we'll save all of our income, spend none of it, but that's the lowest we can go. Or if it's 1, we will spend all of our additional income and save none of it. So um, we have this natural bound between 0 and 1 for the marginal propensity to expend. And formulaically, it looks like this. Marginal propensity to expend is simply the ratio of the changes in expenditures divided by the changes in income. Marginal propensity to consume is an important component of that marginal propensity to expend. All right, the marginal propensity to consume is the additional consumption that occurs when we have a um, change in income. So it's one of the largest components of MPE. Why? Well, because consumption is one of the largest components of our, um, 
of total expenditure. So marginal propensity to um, consume is less than one because individuals only consume part of their income. It's going to be greater than zero because they will consume some of their income. So marginal propensity is important um, to import is the change in imports that occurs when a change in income. Um, income taxes reduce people's income, which lowers their expenditure. Taxes reduce um, marginal propensity to expend. So we need to take into account this marginal propensity to consume. We're going to talk about some of the marginal propensities to import. But then we're also going to have to talk about the limiting factor that taxes will play um, within our model. So the aggregate expenditure functions, the relationship between aggregate expenditure and income can be expressed mathematically as following. All right, aggregate expenditure equals the autonomous expenditure plus marginal propensity to expend times income. All right, we can break it up very easily, autonomous versus induced, just like that. We can also break this up um, that the autonomous consumption is equal to autonomous consum or autonomous expenditure is autonomous consumption plus autonomous investment plus autonomous government spending plus autonomous net exports. All right, these are all the components of CIG and net exports that are independent of income. So, if autonomous consumption or expenditure is one hundred and ninety dollars. All right. That's the sum of the autonomous consumption, autonomous investment, autonomous government spending, and autonomous foreign sector spending, uh, which is sums up to this 190 here in our numerical example. All right. If we have a slope, a marginal propensity to consume of 0.6, then we can, from that, determine the expenditure function. So to, uh, autonomous shifts in expenditure function. Um, uh, so changes are usually classified by which of the four subcomponents of autonomous expenditures shifts. So these are shocks to the expenditure function that we've talked about. So we can have shifts to each one of these components that we've talked about so far. All of these can change suddenly, and when one or more do, aggregate expenditure shifts up or down. And we can talk about these in terms of uh, autonomous shocks because, or uh, exogenous shocks outside the system, because all of, everything that affects the autonomous component of components of expenditure has to be outside of our model. All right. Um, economists look at autonomous um, components as they develop their forecasts for, for the economy. All right, we have to take a look at this. We have to know where we start out. So let's talk about equilibrium. Well, if we plot both of the functions that we've talked about, aggregate production function and the aggregate expenditure functions, we can see that we can get a short-run equilibrium at the intersection of these two. Um, at income levels higher than, or so at income levels higher than planned um, production, so higher than this, so if we're at income level over here, what happens? Well, we produce more than we spend, which causes us to want to have a unexplained increase in our inventories, and so production decreases. If we're below this equilibrium, what happens is we have an unexplained or an unexpected reduction in inventories which causes production to get ramped up and so if we're on either side of this equilibrium we get pushed back to the short-run equilibrium and that's it for section 2.1